All right, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome. I am Jason DeFalco, superintendent in BMR, and I am joined here this evening with uh, Mr. Matthew Aaronworth, our assistant superintendent. And we're looking forward to spending some time together tonight uh, and talk a little bit about our FY23 budget or our budget for next school year. Um, and uh, at the end of that, have an opportunity for a, a brief update on our facilities work, uh, specifically the work around uh, looking at our high school, uh, determining the needs uh, of the high school and putting in our statement of interest to the Mass School Building Authority. So uh, we have a um, very full agenda, so to speak, uh, and we're really pleased that you're joining us, or even if you can't be here live, if you take a few minutes to just tune in and watch it at a later time, that's awesome too. Um, by all means, please do send your questions along. We look forward to answering them um, as we go this evening and doing our best to make sure that we explain both our budget and our facilities work in a way that uh, makes sense to our school district community. Uh, Mr. Aaronworth, anything I missed on our intro? Nothing else I can think of, no. All right, perfect. So with that, uh, why don't we get started? And we're gonna start our conversation uh, tonight around budget. And we know that uh, everything we do is connected back to our district improvement strategy. Um, I will just say briefly that uh, many of you tuning in probably have heard that we are nearing the end of our current district improvement strategy or uh, known as what's also known as our blueprint 2.0 uh, blueprint uh, plan. And we are in the process of developing our blueprint 2.0 or our uh, updated strategy. And so there'll be more information on that to come uh, through the spring. But as we think about our budget and we think about our financial resources, we always make sure that all of our dollars are anchored back to outcomes for students because that is why we are here. And we uh, tonight we'll talk a little bit about these four areas, uh, what we refer to as the what, the how, the whole child and the community, and specifically how we have anchored our uh, fiscal resources to um, improving our outcomes for our students. Uh, but before we jump into that, we thought it might be helpful to just uh, take a moment to pause and uh, think a little bit about where we were last spring and uh, talk a little bit about where we are right now on some really important measures. Uh, on the slide in front of you, these are the state determined measures um, that many of us um, are kind of, you know, they're, they're uh, kitchen table conversation uh, kinds of names. Um, in that we have spoken a lot about them and they're really common. Um, and so we wanted to just highlight a couple this evening, specifically around our four-year graduation rate at our high school, which is currently about 95%. So this means that 95% of our students are graduating on time uh, with their diploma, which is wonderful. And as we look at our MCAS results from last spring, it's important to remember that last year we were in a really interesting year of uh, kind of a hybrid model uh, for most of our tested grades, uh, although not third grade. Um, but you can see uh, by looking at our data that uh, even in this uh, state last year where we had these kind of cohorts and kids coming in and out uh, until we were all back together again in the spring, last spring, um, on our state assessments, we still finished out more or less where the state is in grades three through eight. And we were just um, a bit behind at the high school. Um, so just wanted to take a moment to just kind of refresh uh, all of us with where we, uh, where we were last year. Again, keeping in mind last year was a really uh, tricky year to navigate in general with the pandemic. And of course we knew it would have an impact on our student achievement. So let's talk a little bit about where we are. Uh, because I think that these are really important numbers to look at. Um, so what you have in front of you is an overview of our beginning of year to middle of year star um, growth results. And for those of you who uh, may not be quite familiar, star is our internal assessment that we use to help us measure our student growth on English language arts and then mathematics. And this is a nationally normed test, which means our students are compared against all other students in their grade who take this test across the country. So there's, a, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of students who are taking this exam uh, multiple times a year. 
Um, and that is such a good piece of information because it's important to know that when you look at our second graders here on our slide, that they're not being compared to just second graders in Massachusetts, that they're actually being compared to second graders across the country that take the STAR assessment. And so um, one of the important pieces to note if you look at our student growth percentile, which are the numbers in the column on the right, um, the average or the target we're looking for is 50. So let me just say that again, the target that we're looking for is 50. You can see that in every single grade with the exception of one, all of our students are outgrowing their peers and they are over that 50th percentile uh, marker. So that is a really good news. Uh, and I reference that because um, you may recall that a couple of years ago, we moved forward and the school, uh, school committee supported as of the towns, the purchasing of a new um, literacy program, which we are ending our second year with. You can see that we are starting to get some really strong results um, from having really robust curriculum resources and materials in the hands of our students and teachers. And we're really pleased about that. So again, lots of good news here on our internal assessment as far as the growth of our students is concerned. If you look at math, you will see a bit of a different story. Um, you will see that we do have our growth percentiles. Again, same test, that star test, same target, that 50th percentile. But you can see at grades three, four, five, seven, and eight are at or above the 50th percentile marker. So we still have some room to grow and we've got a ways to go, but we're making some progress for sure. Um, and again, as we talk about our budget tonight, um, you will hear us talk a bit about the work we are doing with the implementation next year of a brand new math program. Uh, we have gone through the process this year of identifying, uh, using research, a really strong program that gets really good results for students. And now we're in the process of the implementation, uh, the purchasing and implementation of that. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. And as I'm sure people are aware, uh, our budget is not put together in a matter of days. It is a relatively time consuming and a very collaborative process. So we have this slide here just to outline the steps that have been taken so far um, so that people can follow along. It all begins with us establishing a timeline with the school committee. So we'll agree to the timeline so that they are aware of when they're gonna be getting presentations and when we have to have our budget numbers in by. Mm -hmm. Uh, then Dr. DeFalco and I speak with the principals and we ask each principal to identify their school needs. And this year, again, we were focusing on the remediation of both academic and social emotional gaps, which were caused by the COVID pandemic. But we also wanted to make sure that principals were focused on their school's instructional focus, which is um, what they want their teachers to be focusing on from an instructional perspective and what their students are learning. And you can see those instructional focuses in big, bright banners all around our schools and in signs everywhere. So be on the lookout for those. Uh, then the principals go back to their buildings and they work with their staff or their department heads and they have everyone's input put in for the resources that we're looking for. And then we, I apologize, I was just checking the, the buzzing. Uh, Dr. DeFalco and I are taking questions via text message, so I just was distracted a second, wanted to make sure I wasn't missing a question. Um, but again, the, the building principals work with their teachers and their department leads. They put together these budgets. Then the cost center managers, meaning either the department chairs or the principals, they meet with myself and Dr. DeFalco and we review all of the requests in detail. Then Dr. DeFalco and I took all of that information together and we went line by line. And I can say we spent probably a minimum of a dozen hours going through line by line, seeing exactly what it was that we thought we could initially remove from the requests. And then after we do that, the budget, um, workshops occur, which is the cost center managers have the opportunity to present their requests and identify their priorities 
to the school committee and to the public. So this is an opportunity for people to hear what what resources teachers and um, principals are looking for, what some new things might be that are being introduced into the budget. And it's an opportunity for the school committee to really understand why the principals and cost center managers are asking for the things that they're asking for. So once these budget workshops are done, the school committee has a better understanding of where they're coming from. And then administration and the school committee sit back down and we go line by line and identify other areas that we could potentially make reductions in. Um, after we did that, we put together a preliminary budget. We held our budget hearing for the public on March 10th. And you can see that our budget was certified by the school committee on March 24th. On this slide, we have a number of grants listed. I am not going to list every single one of them, but I will say, that this slide is important because we are not just using the funds that we get from chapter 70 or the funds that we get from the towns. We are supplementing those funds with a large number of grants, many of which we write competitively for. So you can see that we received this year and in future years, we're gonna be receiving this uh, nursing and health support grant of $100,000. We have a number of grants that have really been going towards supporting our career pathways and the uh, BV Excel program that we're running in collaboration with a couple of other districts in the area. And you can see that we had other grants that were able to allow us to do some extended learning time for students, both in the summer and after school. And the total of these grants comes out to over $2 million. So Dr. DeFalco and I like to just point out that these are an important piece of the funding that we receive, and we try to make use of every penny that's available, and we go after every cent that we can. And so when we think about our budget for next year, our FY23 budget, uh, we are very focused on a few key strategic areas. And I know uh, Ms. Aaronworth has mentioned already looking at that acceleration piece and making sure that we're help, helping to really kind of narrow learning gaps for kids. In other words, helping them really get the information that they, that they don't understand, or maybe they miss because of an impact from COVID and having that hybrid model. Um, we know that there's a lot of work to do as a result of that. And so you'll see that our budget this year for FY23 is really focused on what we call closing gaps and really advancing the district specifically around implementing our new district blueprint. That's our blueprint 2.0 that I mentioned a few moments ago. Um, we are still very focused on minimizing what we call those non-academic barriers. So these are, those are things that can get in the way of our students learning, um, specifically around social emotional challenges or behavioral challenges. Um, so we are continuing to stay very focused on those. Um, the implementation of our new math program, which we're really excited about. Uh, as you know, we have a curriculum revision cycle in our school district. Uh, in the past uh, four years, we have put in place new science programs, new literacy programs. This year, it's new math. And next year, we are starting to study social studies. Uh, our kids and teachers deserve cutting edge materials in their hands. And so we have been very focused on that. So we're excited about that work. And of course, as you saw on the slide prior, um, the different uh, focus areas we have on our career development and our dual enrollment pipeline. And that is something that is really exciting for all of us. Uh, and that dual enrollment piece is really a program uh, that we are looking at on both ends. So on your way into high school and on your way out of high school. And next year we will have a cohort of eighth graders that applied, were interviewed and so, uh, applied for, were interviewed and selected to, uh, as eighth graders, take two classes at the high school for high school credit uh, if they decide to go to BMR, which they should, we hope they do, um, as freshmen, which will then open up their schedules as juniors and seniors for them to take courses at Quinsigamond Community College for college credit. Uh, so we're really excited about that accelerated pathway and that dual enrollment pipeline to help our accelerated learners really move forward. Uh, and graduate from uh, BMR High School with college credits. So more specifically, 
Uh, and this just this just breaks down a, a bit in a bit more detail uh, what we were just discussing. But looking specifically at this resources and staffing, our implementation of our new math program, which we're starting this year. Um, we are already in the process of ordering the materials, scheduling our launch for staff, so that when um, when we return, our faculty will have the materials, resources, and be uh, and be ready to roll. Our, our identification of a new core social studies uh, program in grades PK through 12, which is very exciting for us, because at the end of next year we will have completed a, a full cycle of the core subject areas, and then we'll we'll start looking at the enrichment areas, and that cycle will continue. Again, working on that career readiness aspect of our work, the social emotional learning. We have done a lot of work around diversity, equity, inclusion. And, and I, would, I would phrase that more so in creating a school system where all students feel they belong, uh, because that is a major focus uh, of us. You know, if our, if our students don't feel that they belong, they don't feel safe, they're not gonna be able to learn. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work around after school programming and we're looking to really infuse some life back into our uh, after school activities. Parents, if you're tuning in, we would love to have students engaged in clubs and enrichment offerings and chorus and band and athletics. Uh, it seems like post COVID, it's been hard to re-engage students in those things. So uh, parents, we, would, uh, we definitely would love your help to help our students get re-engaged. Um, we know that at the high school, which we're gonna talk about in a few moments, uh, we have some current issues that are necessary to take care of, particularly as it relates to some of the asbestos challenges that we've had and making sure that uh, all of our, all of the necessary steps are being taken uh, in our next budget cycle to keep everybody safe and to keep our asbestos encapsulated uh, in the way we need to. So uh, we're glad that that remains a priority for us. We also will have other capital needs um, that over the year uh, will be identified by a small, a small uh, committee of individuals that are working on putting those priorities together. Uh, we have added a 0.6, which sounds a little silly, but it's basically a part-time history teacher to the middle school because currently we have a part-time teacher in addition to the other full-time history teachers at the middle school. And we need to make that current part-time teacher another full-time uh, social studies teacher at the middle school. Um, so if you're wondering, how do you have a part-time teacher? Well, we have a part-time one now. This additional part-time actually balances it out and makes it full-time. Um, and then we are able to uh, add two additional substitutes uh, to, the, to the school district to help out with uh, any issues that may occur. As uh, all of you tuning in know, if we have a staff member who tests positive for COVID, uh, they do need to quarantine for five days. So you can imagine, um, while cases certainly are down now, we're very pleased about that. We want to make sure we're prepared and ready in case you see a spike sometime uh, next year that we'll have the additional substitutes on hand to help out. Um, and then lastly, uh, Mr. Aaronworth mentioned, and I think it's important to, to restate, the budget that we are presenting tonight actually has 1.9 million in requests removed from that and in efficiency. So things that we found uh, while we were doing some budgeting and some like, you know, uh, projecting on what we think things are going to cost for next year. Um, we don't just take our budget and roll it over from one year to the next. We actually review it every single year and we look for efficiencies. And so we're able to find uh, some efficiencies and reductions in terms of removing some of those items. Um, and just to reiterate to Jason's point, I, I didn't point it out specifically, but on the process slide, there's reference to when Jason and I sit down and go through each of the lines, we actually have a five-year expenditure trend for each one of these, actually for every single line in the budget. And we go through those and we look at what our current trends are and what everything has cost in the last five years, which are um, the ways that Jason was stating, we we're able to find some areas where we could improve our efficiencies. And that brings us to where we have a certified budget right now. Uh, this is the budget that the school committee certified on March 24th. And this slide has a breakdown of the different function codes and how much money is spent in each of those function codes. So if you look to the left, a function code is a little four digit piece of their budget line that identifies what that amount of spending is going toward. 
So if you look to the left in this in the column that you're seeing, you'll see the function code next to the description of what is in that function code. You'll note that the two that two of the biggest uh, expenses are right up top, and those don't have function codes. Those are not those are not numbers that the district budgets for, but those numbers are given to us from the state, and those are our school choice costs and our charter tuition costs. And you can see that, again, one of the reasons why we're putting so much effort into our career pathways and our enrichment opportunities and the experiences that we have for our students here at BMR is because we don't want them to leave. Uh, and you can see that we currently spend about $1.5 million in this upcoming year for students that are leaving via choice or charter. To the right of the larger column, you'll see a summary. And essentially what the summary does is it takes all of the various function codes from each general bucket and it puts it together into a small summarized amount that is a little easier to see. And then we have a small graphical analysis below. And as you can see, the number that we are looking at this year is $28,661,304. And that is the overall uh, gross operating budget for the district that was approved by the school committee on the 24th. And Matt, we, I know we're in the process of putting together our budget book that will explain all of this and have it broken down because uh, this is the district snapshot, but it will have it broken down by school, right? It will. It will have it uh, some further explanation of a few pieces of the, the budget, and then it'll be broken down by school and also special education costs are separated as well. And we'll be, have that uh, hard copy and available online, I believe. Correct. Great. This next slide, as you can see, is a we like to call it the, the moment of truth. This seems to be the slide that everyone wants to get to, understandably so. Um, but before we get to the, the bottom line of the assessments, again, Dr. DeFalco, myself and the school committee, we want to be very clear that we are using every source of revenue that we possibly can. So if you look at this, this slide, you'll see not just the assessments, but all of the revenues that the district is bringing in. So you'll see that we have, uh, starting with the, the pink row up top, we're going to be using additional circuit breaker funds in FY23 of $175,000. We have our ESSER two and ESSER three grants that we've been using. And we're also going to be rolling some funding from those grants over from this fiscal year that we were able to save. and we're going to be adding those to our expenditures for next fiscal year. And then Matt, we're also, you, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you just explain to folks at home what circuit breaker is and what SR2 sure. and SR3 are? <laughs> Absolutely. I apologize for that. Our circuit breaker fund is a reimbursement that the district gets for uh, large special education costs. So the circuit breaker fund is essentially it's kept separate and it's, almost like a rolling bank that the district is allowed to accumulate. And its purpose is to offset costs. Well, in addition to ones that we've already spent, we have that little amount of funds set aside so that if students move into the district that, are, that have costly special education needs, funds from that account can help offset the cost of those expenses. The ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, ESSER stands for uh, the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, that is the COVID grants that the district received from the federal government um, through the state. ESSER two funds were able to be used uh, this year, and we will be able to use them next year. The ESSER three funds are being used this year and will be able to be used also in FY23 and the following year in FY24. So that's one of the reasons why um, there's some savings this year and we're looking to roll them into next year's expenses that we're charging to the grant because the grants are multi-year expense grants and we're able to do that versus some charges that are to the general fund 
the general fund ends on an annual basis, we don't move any of that money forward. So again, continuing to look at the revenues, you can see that we've listed all of our state revenues from chapter 70. We have our regional transportation estimated receipt, which is the reimbursement that we get from the year before what it is that we spend on, on busing. We have some special education grants that you'll see and our Title I grants. We also add in all of the revenues that the district takes in on its own, which would be athletic fees, music user fees. We rent some of our classrooms to um, a collaborative program that we are actually a part of also. So we, we earn some income through classroom rentals. And then um, we also have a large sum of money that we collect from Medicaid. Our Medicaid revenue is actually also a reimbursement. What that is, is during the course of the year, our health service providers like occupational therapy, physical therapy, our psychologists, um, though, though they deliver services to students and there's some amount of funding that the district gets returned through this Medicaid reimbursement plan. And what you can see is that leaves the remaining cost, all of those revenues are taken right out of that gross operating budget, which we referenced earlier. And that leaves that remaining cost to the towns of 13,437,000 000, approximately. And to the right, on the lower side of this sheet, you can see each town's assessment. So you can see the minimum local contribution for each town, the exclusionary costs, which are the transportation costs after we utilize the reimbursement for transportation. The additional is the above minimum local contribution and each town has their own separate capital costs that are charged to them. Something that's really important to point out this year for the FY23 budget is the purple and gold section slightly above the uh, full assessment breakdowns. You'll see that the, the minimum local contributions are listed for each of the towns. And I also listed FY22's minimum local contributions. And you can see that this year, both towns saw in fact, after analysis, and this is mentioned in the budget book, this is the largest increase in MLC that either town has seen in over five years. So you see an increase in the MLC for Blackstone of over $480,000. That's an equivalent of a 6.83% increase to their minimum local contribution. And Millville saw a $153,000 increase which raised their MLC by 6.7%. Matt, just to restate it, the state sets those numbers on the towns, is that right? That is accurate. The district has no control over the minimum local contribution. Those are, those are based on tax revenues and property values that are in each of the towns, and that number is derived from the state. But you are also able to see that if we move to the lower left-hand corner, despite the large increases in the minimum local contribution, the district was able to really get the assessments into a place that could be palatable for the towns. Um, so if you take a look, without including the capital assessments, which is really the stuff that the district can control, um, the towns are seeing, uh, without the capital, Blackstone's assessment increase is a 3.03% increase from FY22. And thank you for hovering the uh, cursor yeah. over that, Jason. I was looking for my annotation thing to see if I could start it, but I can't <laughs> find it. Sorry. And Millville, uh, you can see, has merely a 1.01% increase. Um, the increases are slightly higher when we factor in the capital costs for each town, but each town, one of the reasons that the capital costs are a little bit higher this year, um, we had the, the new accelerated repair project at JFK, which included the, the doors, the windows, and the boiler replacement. 
and we had the project at Millville, which was the boiler replacement. And both of those projects are going to require some principal pay down um, this coming fiscal year. So there was a bit of an increase to the capital um, expense lines in their assessments. But overall, you can see that the increases were relatively minimum for this year. So this might be a good place to pause and see, Jesse, do we have any questions that are coming in before we jump into a brief update on our facilities work? Nothing yet. Okay. All right, uh, Matt, why don't we roll then right into just the, the, the quick overview on uh, where we stand with our um, building project. Absolutely. So for the transition, you can see, um, this work did not again start this year. Uh, we have been working on this project for a significant amount of time, dating all the way back to 2020, which is when things started to really take shape. We actually were initiating this project prior to May of 2020 when we put out our request for proposals to see who were, was interested in helping us with our facilities assessment. So that was a process within itself. We were able to get DRA, Drummy Roseanne uh, so, uh, Anderson, sorry, Drummy Roseanne Anderson, our design company to work with us on the facilities assessment. And they did a very comprehensive assessment, which the district was able to um, put into publication that was shared online and presented during school committee. But after we had that facilities assessment, it really pointed out the need to put together a working group. We put together our, our capital planning subcommittee of the school committee to dive deeper into that assessment. And initially we were looking to see, okay, what are the costs going to be and what are our next steps? And as you can see in this outline, after really reviewing the, the package as a whole for the facilities assessment, we're staring down a cost of over $80 million in repair expenses just in today's cost. So what that did was in, in our subcommittee, while we were looking at the costs and determining, okay, how should we take our next steps to see what to address, it brought up the whole idea of maybe we need to be looking at the district as an entirety and seeing if we can get some support for this work. Um, it was clear that through our facilities assessment, the high school building is really in the greatest need of repair. Um, there are issues that are ADA compliance. There are issues with it really meeting the needs of our instructional programs and really questioning how it is that we are gonna move the district forward with these career pathway programs and other work that we wanna do with a high school being in the situation that it is in, which is it's been kept in nice shape by our custodians. However, physically it is deteriorating over a long period of time. So as part of this work, you can see that we created a position of the director of facilities and we are working on our, we did put together a master capital plan, which has identified all of the specific things in each of the buildings that we need to address. Um, and it prioritizes those things based on health and wellness of the, of the students and integrity of the programs that we run. And that will enable us to continue looking at those, those pieces of the capital plan and prioritizing them to see where the towns want to allocate funding for on an annual basis. But concurrently, we're not only looking at that capital plan with respect to the things that we can fix, but it really moved us in this direction of developing a master plan. And our master plan um, after we did a full analysis of uh, space in our buildings, we were able to do a demographic study and an enrollment study. We looked at each of the schools and what they had to offer for space. And we talked about what were options on reconfiguring the district, essentially. And through these meetings, 
you know, we identified something that was surprising to us. Uh, quite frankly, we didn't go into the, these meetings with a specific objective other than addressing the facility needs. But as we as we stated, the facility needs became so glaringly expensive and the buildings became glaringly underutilized during these conversations. And it really led to us saying, we could move some things around. And after looking at various configurations, we decided that a two building configuration for the district might be the most efficient operating model for us from a capital standpoint. Um, and we were able to identify that we, sh we could fit our pre-K through five program in what currently is the Hartnett building with some small modifications. We would have to add uh, some bathrooms to classrooms that would accommodate our preschool students and some of our lower elementary level students and you know some other modifications. But that would house, as I mentioned, our pre-K through five program. And if we are able to get into this MSBA, the MSBA meaning the Massachusetts School Building Authority, they have a pipeline for core renovations or reconstruction. And we are in the process now of developing our plan to submit to them to do renovations or a rebuild, so to speak, on our high school, with the goal being to turn it into a 6 through 12 building where both middle school students could be in one section of the building and high school section uh, high school students would be able to attend in the other section of the building, which also lends itself nicely to the crossover programs that we've been really working to develop. The accelerated eighth grade program um, that Dr. DeFalco mentioned, and also our career pathways, which have bridges from the middle level into the high school program. Mm -hmm. Did I cover the bulk yeah. of what's been I mean, done? You did. It was really helpful. Thank you, Matt. And I think that that's actually a nice kind of segue to where we are currently and where we're looking to go. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to just share a kind of a, a, a brief kind of thought around what Matt was talking about earlier, which was that two building uh, concept that the um, capital planning committee had come up with at the end of, I don't know, a year of, of work um, in conversation and reviewing our demographics and all of the capital information that Matt has already mentioned. But we do want to put a caveat to that to say that that's just a thought. Um, to really determine what we need to do next um, is, is to put in a statement of interest or also referred to as an SOI. You may have heard that, but a statement of interest with the Mass School Building Authority that basically says to the Mass School Building Authority, hey, we're interested in a project uh, in, in Blackstone Millville Regional School District. Our most needy school is the high school. We'd like to look at that building for some type of work, core renovation, new reconstruction. We're not sure, but the statement of interest gives the Mass School Building Authority all the information that they need to help determine whether or not we'd be invited into their pipeline for review. And that's presently where we are. We are in the process of putting together our statement of interest. Um, in a recent conversation with one of our, with one of our local boards, it was asked uh, if we would send the letter to uh, the boards when we're done writing it and sending it. It's not, and, and I was explaining that, it's not a letter necessarily although it's referred to as a statement, it, it certainly would imply that it's a brief uh, letter of interest, if you will, not. Uh, it is not presently, <laughs> it's about a 20 page document that uh, we are still putting together to submit that has all of the uh, kind of the summary points of the specs from that big capital project review we had done uh, that Matt has mentioned. And I know we have uh, shared uh, quite a few times uh, with our school community. Uh, and so what will happen is we will submit that within the next few weeks. Uh, the, the due date is uh, April 28th, but we'll have it in uh, just before that, if not uh, sooner. 
And then we'll know sometime in July if we've been accepted into the pipeline. If we are accepted into the pipeline, um, that is when we will have to have some real serious conversations, further serious conversations with the community, uh, because then we will need something called a feasibility study. Now, the feasibility studies, as referenced underneath the upcoming work, uh, is something that can cost between a million and 1.3 million uh, to fund. But I will say that if um, the two communities vote to approve the feasibility study when the feasibility is done, and we actually look at what the final option would be uh, for a new build or renovation, that money for the feasibility study actually gets rolled into the overall cost of the project and part of the reimbursement rate. Um, so I don't want to get too far down that uh, pathway, but it is important to note that right now there is no financial obligation uh, from either town, from the district, um, but we certainly hope uh, that, you know, uh, we'll get some good news from the Mass School Building Authority and be able to move forward to that next step so that we can actually get the experts to look at our facilities to say, hey, wait a minute, have you considered A, B, or C? Um, and so it's important to note um, that as we continue to have these conversations over the next few months while we're waiting to hear from the MSBA, um, that getting invited into the pipeline would mean that essentially uh, we would have experts on the ground um, that would come into the district and really do a deep dive into our facilities to see what makes the most sense for us. Yeah, and I know you mentioned it, but I'll just very clearly reiterate, as I mentioned earlier, our committee looked at reconfiguration options and the determination from our committee, which was not consisting of designers and architects or anyone with, um, significant infrastructure information. I mean, we did have a designer helping guide the process, but um, it was more surface level. Uh, but we came up with that potential to building configuration. This feasibility study that Dr. DeFalco has been speaking of will clearly identify whether that's accurate or not. They may turn around and say, mm -mm, this two building this two building idea that you have really won't support what you're looking to accomplish. And you're going to need three buildings or maybe four buildings. And we recommend you doing A, B, and C. They may even recommend different modifications to the high school. So um, again, I just want to really drive that home. That is when the experts come in and give further analysis of what the, the most the most viable options are. So let's pause here before uh, we conclude and see if we have any questions. I know Jesse just said there was nothing that had come in yet. And as we're waiting, uh, it's, you know, definitely again, those of you that are tuning in, thank you for tuning in and know that there will be multiple, multiple conversations on uh, the facilities work as we continue through the spring and and uh, summer months. Jesse, anything floating out there? Any questions? And anybody that's tuning in or tunes in later, doesn't look like we have any questions. You can always email either myself or Matt, but we also created an email address, uh, as you remember through COVID, um, that is still active that we are using for our facilities project, which is B uh, BMR support. B-M-R-S-U-P-P-O-R-T, B-M-R support at bmrsd.net. So you can always email any questions, of course, directly to Matt or myself, or you can email it to the BMR support at bmrsd.net. Jason, I, I did think of another piece of information that might be helpful for the public to know. We did mention, and it may have been mentioned, I, I apologize, if I, if I missed it, we were speaking about the feasibility study and the feasibility study is the first place where we would need to speak further to the towns and look for funding to make sure that we could get the feasibility study done. However, even entering into the feasibility study portion of this work, that does not obligate us to make any changes to the buildings or the district. So, as part of MSBA's process, we start the feasibility study, 
we get an opportunity to review what the experts have determined and what the plans are that they are looking, you know, if we move forward to move in that direction. And then even after that's all said and done, the towns have another opportunity to vote as to whether or not they want to fund the project as presented. So this first step is really important because it allows the district to see whether or not we're on the right track and it gives us the actual options that make the most sense from an architectural and educational perspective, but it doesn't commit us to going through the long haul of, of doing any more um, work in the district. That being said, you know, the hope is that it puts us in the right direction and we embark on that entire journey. However, it's good for the communities to know that there is no obligation with it. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, we will sign off, but please know that we're always here. If you have any questions or comments or anything you wanna send along after the fact, again, you can email us at our direct email addresses or you can send it to the BMR support at bmrsd.net email and we're happy to get back to you. So with that, thank you so much. And just a reminder, tomorrow night for our elementary families, uh, tomorrow being Tuesday, April 5th, in case you happen to watch this later in the week, don't want any confusion, uh, but Tuesday, April 5th at 6.30 is a school safety Q&A with uh, Dr. Remka from the complex, Mrs. Schaefer from uh, MES and our two school resource officers. So with that, we will sign off and have a wonderful evening. Thanks everyone. Thank you.